This is the last lesson that we're going to look at in Unforgettable Days in the Bible. We looked at uh, nine unforgettable days so far. The day that salvation was made possible for us. The day that we make it personal when we are baptized into Christ. Uh, the day that it will finally be made perfect because it all leads us to a home in heaven with God. We talked about the unity meeting in Acts chapter 15. Very key situation. Uh, the church could have been divided for a long time to come, but they settled that, and uh, we had a strong church come from that. The Red Sea, uh, a miracle that was performed that uh, touched Israel for many years to come and helped them get settled into the promised land. And I think one of my favorite ones was the unforgettable lesson that Jesus taught his disciples. Washing feet, being a servant the last lesson that he possibly could have taught them before his death. And sometimes you remember that last lesson for a long time to come. Pentecost, the reason we're here today on a Sunday is because the church started on the day of Pentecost. Paul's conversion, the reason we are here today because Gentile, like most of us are, are allowed to uh, be a part of God's plan. Of course, creation, every day, Around us, we can see signs of the creation that God has made, and it reminds us of Him. One last day, a day that we'll never forget, and uh, this is one that I've kind of created, but it's every day. I think every day we should think about being a day that we'll never forget. Now, most unforgettable days did not begin as being an unforgettable day. They started out as a normal day, and then something happened that made them very memorable to us. And we never know when the next memorable day is going to come to us in our life. Uh, we started this by looking at this is the day the Lord has given. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. A verse that I think is taken out of context for the most part because people want to make that apply to every single day. But in context, it was talking about the day that Jesus was going to die on the cross and make salvation possible for each and every one of us. And I like Psalms uh, 118 because part of that passage is, it is the Lord's doing. It, it, it is the day that is marvelous in our eyes. And obviously, salvation being made possible was the Lord's doing. And it is something that is mar very marvelous to us in our eyes today. But every day, we never know, every day can become an unforgettable day in our lives that we never forget. And so I want us to think about that a little bit this morning. When I was putting this lesson together, I, I, this was the idea that I had, and I wondered how I could present it. And uh, years ago, churches in Detroit area used to come together and they would put on a lectureship every year. Uh, I went to several of those lectureships, enjoyed going to them. And one of the lessons that I remember even today is a lesson by Charles Hodge that he presented. He was kind of a popular speaker in Detroit. I don't know why, but uh, they seem to have him back almost every year for these lectureships. How many of you have heard of Charles Hodge? Scott? Okay. He was uh, from Texas, which makes him very unforgettable. He had this uh, Texas accent. He always says that he was from the Big D. What is the big D? No. Duncanville, Texas. That's where he was from. <laughs> Which is a little town, uh, probably about 50,000, just on the southeast of Dallas, a uh, suburb of Dallas. But that's how he always introduced himself from, as being from the big D. He said years ago that every day he began his day with a cup of coffee and the Dallas Morning News. That's how he started every single day. Most of us probably have a morning routine, don't we? Do you do something that you do basically pretty much every single morning? Now that I'm retired, I, uh, I like to go, I used to go to McDonald's and have a cup of coffee and sometimes an egg, biscuit egg, but now I go to Chick-fil-A and I love going there. Uh, I go probably three, four times a week and uh, I go there because it's nice and quiet. It's a lot better than McDonald's. Uh, coffee and an egg sandwich cost me $2.75 at McDonald's with their discount on coffee. Chick-fil-A, I can go for $2.32. <laughs> the 
uh, the coffee's free because of my age. But uh, anyway, I've got to know the people there. Uh, Trisha's is May because I know pretty much every employee there on the breakfast routine. And uh, so they treat me well. They see me walking up. They have my cup of coffee sitting on the counter there all for me. And uh, I don't even have to order. They just punch in the order. I do have to pay for it, but uh, hopefully that will come down sometime in the near future, too. <laughs> but I like going there and spending like 30 minutes, just quiet times. And verses that I like to do are like, uh, I like to look at Second Samuel 7, which is one of my favorite passages. One that I shared a few weeks ago, Psalms 33, a beautiful psalm about God in heaven looking down on the earth and taking care of his people. So I like that 30 minutes or so where I can sit quietly. Unfortunately, Bob Bobzine comes every once in a while and uh, destroys my quiet. But uh, no, I. Trish. Um, I probably am the only morning person in my family, so uh, I tell you Nathan every once in a while, but he doesn't seem to like to get up early enough to go with me. No, Trish does not go with me. Uh, she did go once when we had all our family here. We went there for breakfast before they took off for Pennsylvania. And uh, anyway, I know probably a half a dozen of the employees there by first name, and we talk, and we converse, and it's, uh, but it's just that 30 minutes of quiet time, thinking, and Bob does not really destroy it. He adds to it, and any time he wants to go, and is willing to pay, I will let him come. <laughs> okay. Charles Hodge quoted from Psalms chapter 5 and verse 3, and this is a verse that I've remembered ever since he shared this with us. O oh Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare sacrifice for you and watch. Actually, he was telling on himself here. He was contrasting the way that he began his day with a cup of coffee at the Dallas Morning News compared with the way that David, who's the author of that psalm, began his day, a day in prayer. Uh, so... Do you begin your coffee, your day with a cup of coffee in the newspaper? Or do you begin your day with a cup of coffee and a prayer? Newspaper has probably become debated, dated today, right? Nobody gets the, how many of you get the newspaper today? All my life I got a newspaper, but uh, I've had to adjust to the new society that we come. And uh, I miss that newspaper, but my new routine is probably more profitable to me than that was. Maybe you're not a morning person, and if you're not a morning person, that's okay. You don't have to begin your day that way. Many non-morning people begin with a cup of coffee, but their eyes are closed during the whole time. They're just not awake yet. But I want to present this lesson in basically saying, how do we approach each and every new day? What do we see? And hopefully we can begin to approach a new day putting God foremost in our life. A song in a book, and uh, also out of Jeremiah, Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness unto me. And I really like that verse because it, it reminds us of maybe how we should begin every morning. I see a couple lessons from Psalm chapter 5, which was Charles Hall's verse that morning. Um, the first thing is that we need to begin every morning to, by putting God into our day. And that's the important concept here. Uh, make it as early in the morning as you can possibly wake up to make it be putting God into your life. Uh, but a second lesson that I see from this is the word watch. And I love that, that word, too. Uh, he prepares a sacrifice and he watches. Uh, the English Standard Version has, we begin the day watching. The NIV has, wait expectantly. The New American Standard Version says something like, be on the watch. 
Begin the day being on the watch for the Lord, waiting expectantly. And I like that idea, wait expectantly. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, you can't get to sleep at night because you're going to do something the next day that has you in anticipation. And so it's hard to get to sleep. When I was thinking of this, I thought of Christmas morning, especially for kids. Uh, sometimes it's hard for them to get to sleep the night before that because they know there's going to be Santa Claus, there's going to be presents the next day, and they have a hard time waiting for that. It's a great expectation for kids. And I can remember when I was a kid, too. That was always a great morning. Uh, perhaps you're going on a cruise the next day. Because you're going on that cruise, uh, it's hard to get to sleep that night because you just want the day to start. So you all know what it's like, right? You've all lost a little bit of sleep because something that exciting that was going to happen the next day. Yeah, that's, uh, I, that's the um, unforgettable days can be either one. So we're trying to emphasize the positive this morning. So um, what does the Lord have in store for me this day? It's kind of the idea that I want to emphasize here. And hopefully we can begin each day. Uh, hopefully the Lord is going to be in our life in a very positive way. The song says, uh, or the verse says, uh, Morning by morning new mercies I see. All have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness unto me. I think mercies there are kind of the meaning of blessings. If we can wake up seeing and expecting the blessings from the Lord, that's kind of a neat way to begin each day. It's good waking up and seeing the hand of the Lord working in our lives. No matter what kind of day we have, if the Lord's working in our lives, then it's going to be kind of a neat and good day. So begin each day with that expectation, recognizing that blessings are going to come from the Lord. And I say this, it's not like God owes us good things. He doesn't owe us a great day. He doesn't owe us blessings. Now I think of Job, he says, naked I came and naked I will return. Uh, so the things that we have, the great things, the blessings that we have are not do us or we shouldn't expect them in the sense that uh, we deserve them. Uh, reminds me of the song that the things that I love are borrowed, they're not mine at all. And all the blessings that we have from God are uh, not because we deserve them, but they are there because he gives them. And we shouldn't expect everything to just be fantastically wonderful. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. That's what I wanted to emphasize, uh, the things that we need. And sometimes I think we have a difficulty deciding between what is a need and what is a want. Do you ever have that difficulty in your life? Sometimes I would rather this read, all I have wanted, the Lord will provide. That's a great way to look at that verse, right? Uh, but I think sometimes that's how we uh, begin to look at life. Sometimes uh, we live a good, faithful Christian life, and we just think the Lord's going to bless us with whatever we want. <laughs> it's good to remind ourselves of the difference between want it and need it. And so I thought we'd do that for a few moments this morning. What is the difference between want and need? How many of you have a cell phone? Come on, raise your hands high. That's everybody, right? Is a cell phone a want or a need? A need. <laughs> You're supposed to say want. It's a need. Do what? This. Oh, there's a difference between a cell phone and a smartphone? What, the cell phone is that a flip thing? Okay, that may be a need then. Okay, a smartphone. All right. How many of you have a flip phone? All right. <laughs> anyway.
Yeah, it's better than the old phones that were heavy and the walkie-talkie kind of kind of things, right? How about a car? Is a car a want or a need? How many of you came by car this morning? <laughs> a want or a need? I was going to say, I lived the first 60 years of my life without a cell phone. I did just, did just fine. All right, so you're saying wants and needs change. Sherry? <laughs> did your husband have a cell phone? I have a cell phone. Okay. Well, you're not supposed to do that, by the way. <laughs> There we go. Uh, car may be in the category of need, then you're saying, right? Uh, for 16 years of my life, I never drove a car. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to grant that. I'm going to say a car is a need, okay? Now, this I'm aiming at you. How about two cars? Is two cars a need? Do what? Depends on where you work. It depends on your family size. So it's a maybe need. Yeah. When my car goes in the shop, I ride a bike. Well, that's my second car that goes in the shop. Trish has the first car, so. Uh, if you both work, yeah. We should ask. We should have Bruce and Don here. They just went down to one car. Anyway, internet, cable TV. Many people have given up cable TV, but they have Netflix and other things to substitute for the cable TV. Internet. We work at home now. Companies are beginning to say, we want our people back to work. And uh, there was a company this past week said, if you're within 60 miles or something, you have to start coming back to work. Uh, but uh, not if you know how to use it. <laughs> yeah, a lot of evil can come from internet as well. Anyway, uh, just getting you thinking a little bit here. No, we, oh, yes. <laughs> I thought you could boil it down to a little bit more basic, uh, you know, um, the, the world is getting a crazy as it is. There's a chance that the heat has to do with this uh, bomb, which could cut out all electricity. And when you evaluate what your basic needs are going to be, it's going to be what they had in the Bible, which is water, a source of water, a source of food. Okay. <laughs> if a neighbor can, can really grow plants, uh, I'm not one of those plant growers. How about cigarettes and alcohol? Is that a need? What? Hmm. Well, I've experienced, I'm sure Ross has too, and Scott, if he hasn't, he's probably going to experience people calling churches asking for help. And they show up with a cell phone and a cigarette asking for money. Uh, that happens. It has happened. Uh, so that I just threw that one in to let us think a little bit more. Uh, but you could go on and on with How many of you like to go camping? Would you rather go camping or stay in a motel? I'm a motel guy. Hi. But there are campers out there that really love camping. Okay. Uh, this is kind of funny because when I think of camping, I think of a tent. People today, when they think of a camp, get in their RV 
where they have electricity, hot water, bathrooms, heat, cold, air conditioning, all those things, and that's camping. That's a motel on wheels. <laughs> there you go. What helps us distinguish between wants and need? Well, Julian just did that quite well, uh, although I think he still has a cell phone and a car <laughs> and a few other things, which, as someone was pointing out, society has changed and deeds have changed too. But when we really boil them down, I think we're getting back to very basic kind of things. When I think of it, I think of uh, seeing someone standing in front of a house where the house used to be because the tornado took it down. Are the wildfires out west that have completely wiped out actually towns? Uh, floods do the same thing. So when you're standing out in front of your house that is no longer there, then you see wants and needs a little bit differently than you normally do. Anyway, a couple other things. Garage door openers. How many of you have a garage door opener? Is that a want or a need? It's a want? Okay. Well, I'm not so sure it's a want. But most of us are too lazy to get out of the car, raise a garage door, and get back in the car and drive it in. So, uh, remote control car starter. How many of you are, can start your car by remote control now? That has quickly become a need. I think it is in Michigan in the wintertime. Uh, but uh, remember the old, I don't, don't remember, but seeing on that starting the Model T's with the crank? Uh, I can, yeah. Okay, a couple of ideas. Heated seats, heated car seats. How many of you have heated car seats? Raise your hands high. I want to see this. <laughs> <laughs> Wants or needs? Yeah, we're getting crazy. Triple A. How many of you belong to Triple A? I have my car. I've been there for 30 years. I started a long time ago because I was poor and couldn't, couldn't fix a flat or whatever. So... I always carry them around. And when my kids were going to school, I made sure that they had it in their car. So they will call me up and ask me to drive to their college and fix their car for them, that kind of thing. It's simple things like electric door locks. How many of you can remember the old days when you had to get in your car, you unlock one door, and then you have to reach around and hand manually unlock every other car door? Still do. Still do. Well, the next car you buy, uh, maybe. I remember the first time we got it, we got a van where if you put it in the driver's side car door and unlocked it, it would unlock all the car doors. That's uh, even before uh, the buttons that we have now. Okay. Electric windows. How many of your cars have electric? Gary, do you have electric windows? No, no. You actually roll your car down, right? We use the expression, roll the window down. We don't roll the windows down anymore. We zoom them down. Remote controls. Do you have a remote control for your TV? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> don't touch that dial, right? Remember that commercial? TVs don't even have dials anymore. Uh, don't touch that button, maybe. Uh, that's why we have children. Uh, we're sitting in a chair. Hey. Give me that remote control, would you? We're too lazy to get up and get our own remote control. So we have kids to bring us the remote control. Uh, <clears throat> Great is thy faithfulness. What is the most important word in this song? Of course, this is one of my things. This is one thing that I always do. You have to pick the word that I want you to pick or else you're wrong. So uh, as you think about that song, all I've needed the Lord has provided. Great is thy faithfulness unto me. Well, the word that you're supposed to pick is the word provide. Great is that the all I've want, all I've needed, thy hand has provide. Uh, why is provide? If you see the word provide there, you think of providence, God providing for us. Providence, I think, is one of the most important concepts that we see taught in scriptures. Where in the Bible do you see providence? as you think about the Bible. 
and God's providence in their lives. This is where you can name a name, a Bible verse. Where? Joseph. Joseph comes to mind, right? See, that's the right answer. She looked at my notes ahead of time. <laughs> Genesis 50. You know, all that happens to Joseph, the imprisonment, the betrayal by his brothers. And if you come to chapter 50, he says to his brothers, you meant it for evil. God was providing for this very day when I've saved the earth from starvation. So, yeah, you think of... Uh, and uh, the providence in the life of Joseph is there. Where else is it found in the Bible? Noah. Noah? Noah and Daniel. Okay. Esther, Esther is the next uh, right answer. <laughs> <laughs> well... You see providence, obviously, in many places in the Bible, but uh, most notably, I think, in Esther, because uh, everything that happens in Esther is God working behind it, but God is never mentioned in the book of Esther. So I think that's uh, kind of the classic example, because that's the way we live today. We can't prove the things that happen to us in life are really God working in life, but all of us believe in providence, I think. Romans 8, 28, all things work together to good for good for those that love him. That tells us about the providence of God working in our life on a daily basis. Excuse me. Some definitions of providence that I pulled out of the dictionary. The protective care of God. The manifestation of divine care or direction. In the word there, the key word is manifestation. Seeing God work in our lives. Is the important thing. Timely preparation for future eventualities. How do you like that definition of providence? That's the story of Joseph, right? Everything that happened to Joseph was preparing for future eventualities. Providence is uh, many times uh, you always see it capitalized because if you capitalize it, it means God is the one that is behind it. Fate as directed by God. We often talk about fate, but uh, if you believe in God, it's more than just fate. It's fate directed by God. God working through natural means to bring about his will. And I think that's the key for us today because uh, there are no miracles. Miracles, you could obviously see God working. But today, we believe in providence it's God working, but he does it through natural means. And that's true. It's God providing for us. So again, you see the word provide in providence. And so that's the best way, I think, to look at and see providence. What's the opposite of providence? Oh, we have a comment. I was oh. just thinking, uh, I like Proverbs 16, 9. It says, in his heart, a man plans his own course, but the Lord determines his steps. All right. And that's true even when we don't see it. You know, God's there directing our steps. We can make plans, but sometimes our plans are adjusted by God. That's the way I like to say it. What's the opposite of providence? Well, if you're a Christian, there is no opposite, right? Uh, what is the opposite of providence? Uh, coincidence or chance. Uh, a remarkable occurrence of events without apparent casual connection. And that's the way that a lot of people in the world see things that happen to them. They don't see God behind the things that happen to them in life. Providence is a God thing. If someone does not believe in God, there is no such thing as providence. You have to believe in God for there to be providence. Providence is learning to see through the eyes of faith. Another definition that I found that I think is true. Uh, you have to have faith in order to see providence. Bill? He's bringing you the mic. Um, 
Thank you. First Corinthians 10, 13, when we are tempted, we are provided a way of escape. Uh, that's a guarantee. Yeah, it's provided for us by God. That means God's watching over our lives at all times to take care of situations Amen. that we may find ourselves in. Uh, do you believe that there are instances of providence in your life? Most of you are nodding a little bit. I like to see big nods. So you, you really, really see providence working in your life. Uh, the big question, I guess, is providence provable? And I think as we generally think of the word provable, we probably say there's no way you can prove it. It's something that you believe, something that you see through the eyes of faith. I love Acts 17, 17. This is uh, the Great Commission, as I always say it. Uh, the Great Commission that we usually think of is not really uh, meaningful to me in my life because I'm not going to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But I like Acts 17, 17. Uh, Paul reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Do you see the providence in that verse? Those who happened to be there. You know, sometimes we talk about uh, going to Wall, uh, to Meyer or someplace and we just happen to run into somebody. Is that a happening or is that providence? Well, it could be either, I guess, but uh, so many stories in the Bible begin with the word happened. Something just happened, and then it leads to something fantastic because God is working behind it. Uh, there are a lot of stories in the Bible of conversions that begin with happened. And one of my favorite stories that I like to tell about providence is of, of Randy and Mary up in Cadillac. You guys don't know them, but... Uh, in Cadillac, we were a small church. We didn't have a lot of money, but we decided one year to invite John Clayton to come and speak to us. John Clayton was one guy you could always get, even if you had no money. He would come, no matter what, and present his series on Does God Exist? How many of you know John Clayton? Yeah, you have know, heard of him. Yeah. The neat thing about coming to Cadillac is that he wouldn't charge us. and We didn't have money to pay him, but... Uh, we actually did pay for his gas and his meals. That's what he asked for. But he wouldn't require that. But uh, we uh, had him come up and present a three-day series on Does God Exist? One of the things that we did do is that we took out a full-page ad in the Buyer's Guide, which was the weekly paper that went around. Uh, anyway, uh, Randy and Mary were someone that were looking. And... Uh, they happened to get a new puppy, and they were training that puppy to go to the bathroom. And to do that, they would lay out papers on the floor. And laying out the papers on the floor, they saw our full-page ad about John Clayton coming. And uh, they came out Friday, they came out Saturday, and they came out Sunday. John Clayton on Sunday in this series would tell his story of how he moved from atheism to believing in God. And of course, many people that are in the audience would uh, want to know his story. So that was his way of getting people out on Sunday to come back to the church, uh, besides just his lectureship. And I think we had probably 10 or 12 visitors that Sunday morning, just because they went out and heard John Clayton. And Randy and Mary came. And then they came back the following Sunday, they came back the following Sunday, and we got a study with them. And eventually, they were baptized. But I still think laying out that paper was a coincidence. Or was it providence? Okay. Well, you don't even know Randy and Mary, so how would you know? So, But anyway, um, I believe it's providence. And there are other instances. Otherwise, they would have never become Christians at that day. I'm sure he's held a meeting everywhere. Uh, he was a teacher by day and a lecturer by weekends. And uh, like I said, uh, 
well-respected man. Well, I got a lot more, so maybe we'll continue this next week and we'll never finish this. No, we're going to finish it today. We got about one minute left here. Uh, Psalms 5, verse 3, going back to that. Uh, it's a great verse to remember. Nehemiah, the story of Nehemiah, chapter 1 begins with, Now it happened. And uh, King sees he says, What's wrong? Nehemiah tells him about rebuilding this wall. And there are a lot of stories that begin in the Bible with it happened or now it happened. Look for that word happened in the Bible because it's more than just happen, happening. It is God working. Anyway, I'm not going to have time to finish all this. So hope you enjoyed the series. I know some of you said that you really liked it. Next week, we're going to have a new, uh, Scott's going to begin a new study of uh, Ephesians. Any direction? You want them to read chapter one or anything? Or... Okay, just show up. <laughs> and he'll prepare us. Thanks for coming. Our time is up, so take a quick break here and then come back to worship.